So, um, today I'm going to present some work that uh, Christian Wilmes, Ericsson Helsien, Felix Hanselowski and me have done in the yeah, last year. Um, we are PhDs, PhD students, except Christian Wilmes, he's already uh, finished. And um, we're doing a little project um, on our off topic, it's not part of our PhD, but um, uh, we thought it might be useful. Um, it starts that we both work in uh, two projects, uh, the Rocky project here in Tübingen and in Frankfurt, and uh, the CRC 806 in Cologne. And um, we are working, so the, the name of Rocky is the role of culture in early expansions of humans. We have these uh, expansions that uh, happened in the past. For example, if you look at uh, Homo sapiens who migrated from Africa to Europe in the last, uh, uh, arrived in Europe the last 40,000 years ago, and the travel time more or less was more multiple tenths of thousands time. And um, my colleague uh, Ericsson is a modeler, he's a bioinformatics guy, and he makes these uh, agent based models you see here. And if you want to model migration over such a long uh, period of time, you have to take into consideration that also the environment is changing. And um, we are now trying to get to prepare a data set that can be used in agent based modeling. Uh, for such things. Here we have one of his examples. This is a model um, with Neanderthals, three different groups of Neanderthals um, who are competing with each other. Who is going first over the finish line? They are driven <laughs> by uh, climate, so uh, it depends which group is better adapted to climate. You see the yellow ones are not very good adapted. They never reach the finish line, but the red and the blues, they're always, uh, yeah, fighting. And um, we want to, um, yeah, we made this data set with, uh, for a variable environment. So the idea behind this is um, we have these uh, Delta 18O records uh, showing the, here is an example from the last interglacial about 125,000 years ago till the last glacial maximum. And um, for the maxima of this uh, chart, we have the climate models. The world climate data set that Felix Hanselowski was already speaking before. And um, you see, they are always at extremes. Here we have the, the LGM model, which is a model by the um, uh, Max Planck Institute. And here we have the Otto Bliesner model. You see already the <laughs> shift. Here it is colder in Europe. And here it is warmer. And um, we created time slices of uh, these data sets, so we made an interpolation be between those two maxima. And we assume that the temperature follows this delta O18 uh, chart. And uh, for example, if you take any pixel, let's take uh, Tübingen, I just make a, an assumption that it was in the last interglacial plus 10 degrees and in the last glacial maximum zero degrees, um, then we um, make this uh, calculations here that we get, uh, um, we called it, I have to look it up, the relative normalized climate factor. So that means if we have a time step, which would be this, which is just between the LIG and the LGM, that is uh, linearly uh, interpolated, so we have a the uh, temperature of 5 degrees if we are between 0 and 10. 
And if we are here between 60,000 and 40,000 years, we assume that we would have a climate of roughly 7.5 degrees. Um, uh, 2.5 degrees, sorry. And so we created these time slices. Um, we decided to use 11 time slices because there's um, a problem with NetLogo. It's, uh, we intentionally made it for NetLogo that uh, projects get too big if you uh, make more time slices and it just doesn't start to work. Yeah, and from that we uh, calculated uh, data that are uh, corresponding to the uh, climate uh, um, models. For, uh, I already mentioned the world climate models. So we have uh, for each month the maximum annual temperature, the minimum annual temperature, precipitation sum of that month, and 19 bioclimatic factors. And of course, uh, what I forgot, we also modeled uh, the um, sea level uh, change, what we had just talked before about. Ours is not as detailed. We have, for example, we, if you make a European model, we should also consider, uh, for example, uh, uh, isostatic uplift because of the retreat of the glaciers and that stuff. All of that is not included because in our scale, it doesn't really make sense. It's too detailed. Um, here we have uh, a map, a nice map, where uh, Christian Wilmes um, applied the well-known Köppen-Geiger climate classification. I guess most of you had it in school. And here you see these climate zones shifting between, the, uh, between today and I think it's even longer than uh, the last interglacial, I think I just saw 140,000 years. Yeah. <coughs> so that's um, the Köppen Geiger classification. We wanted to add more information or derive more information from that data. And so we set up this um, little workflow to, to just to test if we can derive biomes from um, uh, this data and how good it is. So we start with a world climate data set with recent data, so data from today, and uh, we train a model. Uh, today I will show you two results, um, a graphic uh, classifi uh, uh, classifier and uh, uh, maximum likelihood classifier. We want to try more uh, classification and regression trees or support vector machines, but they are not yet uh, processed. Um, when we train the model, we test it, and if the validation is good, we use it. If it's not good, we do it again or leave it. And if we have a model that fits our needs, we do the time step modeling with the 11 time step uh, data sets. So we get 11 biome maps for all these time steps between uh, LIG and LGM. And we want to validate them again with the Palio data, which we derive from different databases. I will talk about that later to uh, see how valid our biome maps are in the end. The first approach is approach we found in a textbook. Uh, it's the Strasburgers Plan Sciences, is this one, and it, this classification is uh, more than 100 years old. It's um, a global classification. All our classifications we are doing are global. And um, you see it's based on annual precipitation sum and annual mean temperature. It's quite nice because it's very simple and easy to interpret. And um, yeah, we did a little workflow here. We use for uh, the, the both data for each pixel, so annual precipitation sum and uh, climate mean and annual temperature, and we look it up and uh, where in which patch it is, the combination. And this uh, 
is then assigned to the pixel. Um, then we get a map like this. This is a map of the last integration where we have um, the cool tempered coniferous forests in the north, also in the Alps, uh, the Caucasus. Caucasus? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and um, it is uh, surrounded here by forest step. We also have uh, steps um, here in the northern German basin and in the northern French basin. We have steppe vegetation according to that model uh, in Spain. And uh, we have uh, summer green deciduous forests north of the Alps and along the Adria. And uh, especially in Italy, we have these uh, sclerophyll hard deciduous plants, according to that model. If it's valid, it's not yet val validated. Um, then we did the same for the uh, last glacial maximum. And uh, we see what maybe you assumed earlier, that where there was a shift. Um, in the north now, we have a cold desert and then tundra. Here I mapped uh, this, what is now not so good seen, the yellow, uh, light blue, is the actual maximal uh, glacier extent after Elas. And it fits quite well with the cold desert, just not in this area. Um, in this area we have here some vegetation where in truth there was, uh, uh, there are now glacial deposits to be found. So we assume that because this comes from the climate model that it was there warmer and the uh, glacier, glacier maybe that was a, a searching glacier, so it was the ablation area, whereas this could be a more stable uh, part of the glacier, but uh, I'm not a glaciologist. And yeah, we, saw, we see that the uh, coniferous mountains might have moved to the south, um, especially south of the Danube. North of the Danube we have this transition zone between tundra and uh, coniferous forest. And um, you see that the summer green deciduous forest appears to be in Italy. No more of the sclerophylls and we have it here on the Atlantic coast. So far, for this method, we also applied it in uh, Egypt, where uh, Felix Hanselowski talked about earlier. There we see that we don't have so good results because, first of all, it's a, a global model. And he talked about it that this area, so we have here this boundary where it was quite uh, high precipitation or not hot desert. We have here all is hot desert because in this model, everything between zero and 500, 500 millimeters of precipitation is hot desert. And we need a more detailed model for this local area. Um, we want to try this in the future models that we just uh, uh, split this patch and make finer uh, patches for desert environments. Yeah, the next thing we tried is the maximum likelihood method. Um, I guess most of you know maximum likelihood classifiers. They, where you train a model and then you, um, based on the probability to which an unknown pixel depends, to which uh, a class you get first a classification of that pixel and the probability uh, how sure you are that it belongs to that pixel. We did that as training data set. We used the WWF world biome, which consists of 14 biomes. And the interesting thing is here in red, um, it shows, it's, it's mapped today, but it shows the original extent of natural communities prior to major land use change. So, 
that means that is what the world look, would, or the vegetation would look like if we were not there and we didn't have such a high impact on uh, the Earth's shape. And that's what we need for paleo modeling. Um, here is the model observed, so that's the original data set. And here is the model with recent data. And um, if it looks the same, it's good. There are some patches where it doesn't work. The one class that didn't work at all were the mangroves. You see it here. Usually mangroves make, on, okay, make only up less than 1% of the uh, air, uh, surface, but here they are uh, very dominant. Um, the next uh, uh, model we will add another layer called um, distance to, to seawater because mangroves only grow where salt water and uh, uh, fresh water is mixing, so we hope to get rid of that problem. And we also did uh, tests for that data set and with different input data and it turns out that these bioclimatic variables and a digital elevation model combined give the best results. It's not a super good result, it's between mediocre and good, but for a standard maximum likelihood classification it's okay. We will try other methods later. Um, here you see a uh, confusion matrix for this data set that worked quite good. We also get an idea how good the single um, uh, biomes performed. If you have a look at the mangroves here, we have uh, in 10,000 data sets, 19 were uh, mapped as uh, mangroves and we found 18 of them, but 196 in total were mapped. So. Uh, only 0.0 or 0.1% uh, were mapped correctly, so we have, a, in this case, a very bad user accuracy. The class is overestimated. And here we have now the Paleo simulation. This is the last interglacial model, and this is the last glacial maximum model. You see, just brief, that there's a movement of um, here, tundra vegetation uh, moving to the south, to the center of Europe. We don't have ice included in this model, um, though there are still patches with uh, coniferous forests and all the other um, uh, zones, bioclimatic zones, are moving too. So here the boreal forest and taiga is moving to the south. And yeah, we see just see this uh, shift of the zones to the south. Now, at the end, we want to do some uh, testing. Um, we will use the modern analog technique where you uh, use pa uh, pollen data or plant remains, past plant remains, and look for the same uh, species or the nearest relative and look at what conditions they live today and uh, make assumptions on what uh, climate they wanted in the past. And we have two sources of data. One is the European Pollen Data Bank and one is the Rocky uh, database. And um, here you see all the uh, plant remains and faunal remains that were found in the time span between the LIG and the LGM. And uh, we want to take the dated ones, look in which time slice of our data set they are, then uh, look if this, for example, if it is a coniferous tree and we have a coniferous tree map, then it's a good validation, and if there's a mangrove, then it uh, is a bad validation. And uh, yeah, that's the future plans. If you want to learn more about this, uh, Biomization and modern analog technique. You could uh, listen to uh, Christian Wilmes talk tomorrow <coughs> morning, and uh, that's so far from my side. Uh,